Have you ever had a bar of chocolate and went like, mmm, this is the best thing ever? Have you ever had an experience where you tried like a drink or tried to go out or something and you had this experience of, oof, this feels so good to be true? And perhaps you had this when you met the special someone or perhaps you had this experiences when you went out traveling and you tasted the local delicacy. And if you've had that experience, then chances are that we are talking about the release of dopamine in your brain. Now, dopamine is the molecule that's released in your brain that's responsible for reward, drive and motivation and having that feeling of vigor and having that feeling of energy. So in this video, we're going to talk about what dopamine is, which parts of the brain it's released, its biology. We're also going to talk about what substances might release dopamine. And we're going to talk about how do you use dopamine to have energy? How do you use dopamine to sustain energy and have that sense of being motivated and alive in this world? So in this video, you'll get a comprehensive guide to dopamine and a bit of tips on how can we leverage dopamine for our own success and our own happiness. All right, point number one, let's talk about what dopamine is. Now, dopamine is a neuromodulator. And by that, we mean that it's a chemical, it's a molecule that's present all across the brain, which is always present in some quantity or the other. So you always have a baseline level of dopamine. So you know, the phrase dopamine hit might be a bit misguided because it's not that in normal times you don't have dopamine in your brain. And somehow when you do something good, that's when you get pish, pish. That's not the case. Oftentimes dopamine is, well, not often, but always there is some baseline level of dopamine that we always have. And so that's why it's called neuromodulator. An analogy that's given often, think of like a symphony music. Like there are certainly peaks and valleys, but there's always some sort of a background music, some sort of background hum that's going along. So that's one way of thinking like an orchestra, like dopamine is like an orchestra all across your brain. Now let's talk about the function of dopamine. What does dopamine do in your brain? So dopamine is often, well, not often, quite, quite always responsible for more movement and it's responsible for motivation and if you think about it it may seem like two different concepts but you know in order to have motivation and do something about it you need to be able to move right and same goes with the other way around like if you can move can you only have motivation and it's also responsible for reward so think what you experience when you eat a bar of chocolate for example let's talk about where dopamine is present in your brain let's talk a bit about the biology of dope so there are three main pathways that are responsible for the release and the upkeep of dopamine, so to speak. Um, so the first pathway is the so-called nigrostriatal pathway. And I know that sounds a lot, but all it means is it starts from a part of the brain called the substantia nigra. Some part that is a part of the brain that I am involved in actively researching. It's a cool part, I must say. It looks a bit dark, by the way. If you look at, look at it in the brain, and I'll try to put a picture here. It looks a bit slightly darker than its surroundings. And I think nigra means in indeed dark, not an expert, but um, it starts in the substantia nigra and terminates in the so-called ventral striatum or the striatum in general, perhaps. Um, and this pathway has been largely suspected to be involved in movement. Now, this is not to say there are no reward or other related behaviors um, that happen in this pathway. And indeed, I have observed some reward related behaviors in this, in this region, especially the substantia nigra, but largely um, a lot of the attribution for this part of the brain is or this pathway has been linked to movement and motivation. So it starts with the substantia nigra and ends with the striatum. The other pathway, which is responsible primarily for reward in the literature, if it starts from the ventral tegmental area and it goes right up to the striatum again. And now this pathway is largely recorded to have some relationship to reward. And quite often the term prediction error gets thrown around. So what we mean by that is when you expect something and you get something, then there is a less of so-called prediction error. You, you have less of a surprise. But when you expect something bad and then you're treated with something mind-blowing, then you have much more release of a dopamine. And that's called a large prediction error, a large surprise factor. And so if you go to a restaurant and let's say you're not expecting much, you haven't heard really good reviews about it, but they, then they bring out their star dish and then you eat it and then the food just melts in your mouth and you have this extra sensory perception and you feel like on top of the world. When something like that happens, there's a lot more dopamine that's released in the brain than when you expected a lot and got a lot. Now, this is not an argument for 
or do not expect much. Uh, and for the reason for that is there's the baseline level of dopamine and that baseline level does vary according to expectations in general. So you need to find like a balance and we're going to talk about how do you find that balance a bit later on. But largely speaking, these two pathways, there's a third pathway which also starts in the striatum and goes up to what's called the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that's making decisions and so on. We're not going to spend too much time on this for this particular video. But just so that you know, there is that pathway and there's actually one more that we're not even going to mention because it's going to be too much. All right, now we're going to talk about how dopamine works. How, what is the function? Like what is the characteristic function and mechanisms of dopamine? Now I already mentioned in the start, but there always is a baseline level of dopamine. The pleasure you experience, let's say when you eat a bar of chocolate is relative to that baseline. So if you're eating chocolate a lot every day, then you might have raised your baseline enough or you might have enough of those spikes that when you eat it for like the hundredth time, you may not get that same amount of pleasure that you may have had when you had your first bar of chocolate. And this, this phenomenon is often referred to as hedonic adaptation, which is the more you adapt to some reward giving experience, the more of a dose of that you need. And um, we see that with coffee as well. Uh, coffee works a little differently, whereas it doesn't quite work with the spikes of dopamine, but it sort of makes dopamine more available. So one way to understand this whole idea of peaks and valleys is to think of an ocean. And I like this analogy, uh, Andrew Huberman, uh, I think popularized this analogy a lot. Think of it as an ocean with waves. So you can have some waves that are like massive and you can have some troughs as a result of those waves also. And dopamine does indeed work that way. Where you have a big peak, you may have a subsequent trough, you may have a valley. And which is why it's not exactly optimal to just bombard yourself with pleasure because if you just do that then you're just prepping yourself for a big valley and as a result you may not be able to while you may have had a good experience consuming something you may have a massive valley and net total that result might not be very satisfying think about it that way now let's talk about some activities that might increase or decrease dopamine chocolate is something that we have been talking about a lot and chocolate raises the baseline level of dopamine by about two and a half times. So if you have a baseline level and if you eat chocolate for the first time, then it's going to raise, it's going to give you a peak, which is about 2.5 times your own baseline. And then there are other activities like exercise, which also raises your dopamine for by about two times. And then there are some drugs. And of course, do not try this at home ever, but drugs like amphetamine, which increase dopamine as much as 10 times. And you can see why these kind of drugs might be useful as pain relievers or even end of life care for that matter. So something to note at this point is that more dopamine is not necessarily better. Why? Because remember the whole peaks and valleys thingy. If you have a peak, then you might be prepping yourself for a valley. And so it's more important that we balance our peaks and valleys rather than just like, you know, exploiting b -b 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 reward, reward, reward. And if we do that, then we may be just setting ourselves to a massive valley and we might be setting, fetting ourselves to a massive feeling bad phase. Let's just put it charitably that way. Um, but on a side note, uh, a lack of dopamine feels really bad. And I've had a personal experience around this. When I was a bit younger, due to some random misdiagnosis, I ended up prescribed this drug which reduced the dopamine in your brain. It's often given for psychosis and I didn't have psychosis, but you know, whatever. I just somehow had it through a massive misdiagnosis. And I took it for a month or two. And I can assure you that was the worst couple of months of my life. Like it was felt awful to not have as much dopamine as I'm used to having and it's like Dementors if you've seen Harry Potter it just feels extremely depressing for lack of a better word although the colloquial depression may not have to do with dopamine per se but it does feel very apathetic or dysphoric when you don't have enough dopamine in your system going on so care for your baseline dopamines so of course the next and the final thing to talk about might be how do you maintain good levels of dopamine this is not about avoiding pleasure either because you want to maintain a healthy baseline as well but at the same time this is not about bombarding yourself with pleasure and just getting that hit after another because you just might be preparing yourself for a massive downfall so what are some good ways of um, raising your baseline dopamine and perhaps even having some spikes interspersed within so there are some techniques that are known to increase baseline 
baseline dopamine. The first one is cold showers. Uh, when when researchers found that a cold exposure in general, I think when researchers found that when you take a cold shower, there is an increase in baseline dopamine, and it can in fact last for a few hours after you take that cold shower. So that does suggest that cold exposure might lead to a sustained release of dopamine throughout the next few hours at least, if not longer. There are other things like eating what's called tyrosine rich foods. So if you've ever had a protein shake, chances are it has tyrosine in it. And when you have tyrosine, what it does is also increase your baseline level of dopamine. So if you've ever felt good and sort of happy in a more stable way after consuming protein drinks, then you might be experiencing the effects of tyrosine. There are other tyrosine rich foods that you can look up. I think some nuts have them and more. And another tip that I could give that is science based on increasing baseline level levels of dopamine is to get morning sunlight. Sunlight exposure regulates a lot of your things like your cortisol, like the feelings of alertness, the feelings of freshness, your circadian rhythm. And another thing that sunlight regulates is your baseline level of dopamine. So if you get sunlight exposure, and I highly recommend that you make it a part of your morning routine, then you will experience an increase in dopamine when you are getting exposed to sunlight. And I actually feel it in my body. Like after a whole night of sleep, I'm a bit, you know, like dull and dark and you're just like waking up you're just muscles are just warming up and when you get that sunlight exposure you feel your body just becoming a bit more alert bit by bit uh, when you get that sunlight exposure so sunlight exposure highly recommended all right so finally remember we all have dopamine and we all manage dopamine and there is a certain responsibility we have towards ourselves to not exploit this dopaminergic system which is so beautiful and it's designed to keep us going in this world. And hopefully some of the tips I gave you here were helpful in understanding dopamine and knowing what to do about it. And perhaps it also points you in some directions on what to do about it. If you're really interested in diving deep, Andrew Huberman, the legend, the master, has a lot of material on dopamine. He has like hours long on dopamine. So I recommend checking out Andrew Huberman's work on dopamine. A lot of the tips and uh, suggestions I gave here were borrowed from his podcast. So thank you, Andrew, for recommending some of this stuff to all of us. All right. So thank you for hanging out with me for this long. I hope you found this video helpful. If you like this video, a subscribe to this channel would be appreciated. But otherwise, thank you very much. This is Sankalp signing off.